This is a video preview of the 1611 King James Bible Deluxe and Super Deluxe Facsimile Editions. The King James Bible is the most printed book in the history of the world. Remarkably, not just the most printed Bible in the world. The year 2011 marked the King James Version's 400th anniversary from 1611 to 2011. It is the English Bible that has stood the test of time and that sounds like the Bible. To commemorate the KJV 400th anniversary, we are proud to offer these exact page-for-page -page photographic duplicates of the original 1611 King James Bible, available in two elegantly bound editions. At the KJV store, we consider the KJV to be THE Bible in English, and we consider the 1611 King James Bible Deluxe and Super Deluxe facsimiles to be the hallmark of King James Version Bibles. Owning an original 1611 facsimile replica of this immense size, magnitude, and beauty means that one possesses a copy of the most authentic 1611 King James Bible in the world. The King James Bible is the only book in the world that can claim 1 billion copies in print. It set the standard by which all subsequent English Bible translations have been measured. For this company and the majority of our customers, the English language Bible as we know it today is the King James Bible. Original first editions have sold for over $400,000 at recent auctions, and over $100,000 went into the production setup to create these magnificent heirloom quality facsimiles. Now, these affordable facsimiles make it possible for everyone to have a first edition 1611 King James Bible. Considered the holy grail of book collectors everywhere, the Bible to end all Bibles, the first edition of the beloved 1611 King James Bible. These faithful and exact reproductions of the very first King James pulpit Bible are indeed works of art and fine craftsmanship beyond compare. Most people have never seen what the original 1611 King James Bible looks like, and having one in your home will provide a great conversation piece and an object of great beauty for all to admire. Each edition is more than a facsimile, it is a masterpiece. Measuring the exact size of the original 1611 printing, an enormous 17 and a half inches tall when it's including its slipcase, 12 and a half inches wide, and 5 and a half inches in thickness. And when this magnificent Bible is open, the full spread is roughly 30 inches when measured corner to corner like a television and weighing almost 30 pounds, so much it nearly takes two people to comfortably move it, this is the finest reproduction of the 1611 ever undertaken. The Deluxe and Super Deluxe Edition facsimiles are printed on 100% rag cotton linen sheet, not wood pulp paper, just like the original 1611. The originals that were actually printed in 1611 were commissioned by King James I to literally be chained to the pulpit of every church in England. And now you can own a facsimile replica of that exact same Bible. These massive pulpit folio-sized Bibles make a great centerpiece for the communion table or the entryway in a church. They are also quite popular as centerpieces for private home libraries. If you are looking for something that will make people stop and stare, this is it. Photographs cannot adequately show, neither can this video show, what a stunning and magnificent display piece these enormous folios are. You will spend hours poring over its magnificent typography and woodcut designs found in the original 1611 KJV, as well as its original prefatory material, such as the translator's preface, genealogies, maps, and decorative title pages. The standard deluxe edition, seen here, is bound in a high-quality, beautifully grained imitation leather, often referred to as Fiscagoma leatherette, or Buffalino Fiscagoma. The deluxe edition Buffalino Fiscagoma features the same size and weight as the super deluxe edition. And finally, it is the only 1611 facsimile edition to feature the seal of King James blind stamped on the cover. As a final shot of the spine of the deluxe edition imitation leather, you see that the raised hubs are slightly less pronounced, but this is still a beautiful and quality edition. Whereas the super deluxe edition shown here 
is bound in the finest grade of full grain, glove soft, hand tooled, exquisite, genuine cowhide leather wrapped over furniture grade birch wood board with extra large spine hub bands and gold spine stamping. The Smithsonian binding also features extra heavy duty stitching. No detail, great or small, was overlooked or spared in the creation of this Bible. It's just like the real ones, visually identical to an original 1611, except that it is absolutely brand new and less than one half of 1% the cost of the last 1611 sold at auction. Do not confuse these amazing photographic deluxe facsimiles with the small inexpensive reprints or with the smaller regular size facsimile that we also offer at the KJV store. The popular Hendrickson 1611 edition, for example, is not a true facsimile and nor do they claim it is. It is a totally new typesetting and a more semi-modern Roman style type without the original woodcut decorative accents or beautiful gothic black letter style typeface found in the original 1611 KJV. Such reprints may maintain the ancient spellings as well as the inclusion of the Apocrypha, but they do not look exactly the same as an original 1611. Similarly, the smaller regular facsimile may look the same photographically as an original 1611 KJV, but it does not maintain the massive size of the original first edition 1611 King James Bible as only the deluxe facsimile can claim. Every single page of this deluxe facsimile or photocopied edition was computer scanned from an original first edition 1611 KJV and maintained at the same original size. Then printed on 100% rag cotton linen sheet, not wood pulp paper, just like the original 1611. And if you see a close up of this page, the back side here, you can actually see the ridges of the rag cotton linen paper. Uh, you can see how substantial this is. That's going to make it better for page turning and give you the longevity and also authenticity. Once again, matching detail for detail, the original 1611 KJV. As a bonus and as our free gift to you with your purchase of the Deluxe Edition or Super Deluxe Edition facsimile, you'll receive one original ancient Bible leaf, which is a full page from an original over 400 year old 1611 King James Bible. So on the Deluxe Edition bonus pages, you'll see there is an Old Testament leaf option, which typically will be a non-title page. Um, this is just an example here of Nehemiah. Your page will be chosen at random. There is also the New Testament section. Uh, you pay a little extra and are guaranteed to get an original leaf, bonus leaf from the New Testament. And with any super deluxe edition facsimile purchase, the standard pricing includes an Old Testament title leaf page. Example here is Ecclesiastes, but the base price would include any Old Testament title page leaf. Uh, it's guaranteed to be chosen at random. And then you can also upgrade to a New Testament leaf as well, which would be a non-title page. Uh, but pretty amazing that in addition to a complete uh, facsimile replica reproduction of the first 1611 King James Bible ever made, you also get an over 400-year-old piece of history, an actual leaf or page from an original 1611 edition King James Bible as a bonus. Uh, those can be priced literally up to $200, $300, dollars if purchased separately. And that's a free gift to you uh, with the purchase of any of these facsimile edition Bibles. A quick note regarding the cost of the 1611 deluxe facsimiles is that sometimes customers uh, will come to us, they'll email us, they'll call us, see our photo online, our listing online. They're shocked to see the pricing of these 1611 deluxe facsimiles. And they certainly not be for everyone. Uh, not everyone is even going to have enough adequate storage or shelf space to possibly have one at their home. But most people don't realize when looking at photos online just how enormous these Bibles are. Virtually any book, let alone a King James Bible, that's 12 by 17 by 5 inches thick and over 30 inches when open, over 30 pound weight when carrying, is going to carry significant cost. But when you consider all the materials and craftsmanship that go into these, you get a better idea of the value that goes along with that cost. Finally, the deluxe edition facsimile, especially the one on the left there, uh, it is significantly lower in cost than other pulpit Bibles, such as the Cambridge Lectern Bible that you'll also see on our site. 
Uh, the Cambridge Lectern Bible, for a fact, is, is probably half the size of this deluxe facsimile, yet nearly twice the cost as of the time of this video. So whenever you start comparing, uh, and anyone does any checking and find, you'll find, as we already know, size for size, pound for pound, feature for feature, the 1611 Deluxe facsimile is actually the best dollar for dollar value in virtually any King James Bible or other printed book that you will find. Now we're getting a closer look at these two 1611 edition Deluxe and Super Deluxe facsimile editions. And again, of course, the Deluxe here is on the left. Uh, that is going to be the Buffalino Fiskagoma imitation leather binding over birchwood boards. Um, essentially, it's imitation leather over a hardcover. And then, of course, on the right is the Super Deluxe Edition, which is the Burgundy Full Grain Genuine Cowhide Leather Binding, also over birch woods, uh, birchwood boards. As you're going to see, of course, a Bible of this size without doing the leather over boards, um, it just wouldn't be able to handle the enormous weight and magnitude of the pages. Again, these weigh literally uh, around 30 pounds each. Um, so kind of the difference in the bindings, you can get an idea here. They're just enormous. They're certainly uh, not easy to handle, but you can get an idea here. So there's the spine, of course, and you see, as we've seen very closely, uh, the raised hubs on the spine of this uh, deluxe edition, which is the imitation leather and the gold stamping Holy Bible, King James 1611. Again, it is the only one that has that seal of King James on the front there that you see. Um, it's enormous. It's, uh, again, 12 inches wide, um, 17 and a half inches tall, 5 inches thick. Uh, that's when it includes, when it comes in the slip cover, which you can kind of get an idea. Here's the slip cover. Uh, these are going to be identical for either edition. In the slip cover, you kind of see um, this basically, this little ridge down here. It's like a little shelf for the pages. So whenever it slides in, it keeps the pages uh, in place and helps to support the weight. Uh, keeps it from the, the rest of the binding being too stressed. And again, the Super Deluxe Edition here on the right, um, as you see, uh, just a little difference. It's a more of a blank cover, um, but my goodness, these raised hubs, the spine, the super pronounced, and you can see how the light pops on that Holy Bible, King James 1611. Um, they're just, uh, there's, as you see, it's just a whole nother level of quality and of detail here. Um, and of course, this being an actual genuine cowhide leather, um, that is certainly a little step up above in quality versus just an imitation leather or the uh, Buffalino Fiskagoma. But um, the genuine leather and this uh, basically whether either edition, whether the deluxe or super deluxe, once you get to the inside, the features are identical. Um, they do use the same paper, um, which is the, the rag cotton linen uh, instead of regular birch wood paper. Um, we've shown an example of how that's better quality. They are both, again, exact page for page, photographic duplicate uh, reproductions and replicas of the original 1611 King James Bible. Um, they're word for word and letter for letter or original 1611 authorized version text. They do include the Apocrypha, as we will see. Um, they are, uh, once again, the rag cotton sheet paper or linen paper, not wood pulp paper. Um, they are Smithsone or Smithsone. We'll show really good examples of that and see the heavy duty stitching. Um, and again, they are big, really, really big, really heavy. Once when they're open, once again, the fact that they literally span 30 inches, nearly 30 inches cover to cover gives you an idea of just how big and beautiful these deluxe edition facsimiles are. Now that we've had a good overview of the physical characteristics and general features of the 1611 King James Bible Deluxe and Super Deluxe Facsimile Editions, we're going to take a closer look at the inside features and that original 1611 text. The first thing you see when you open the 1611 Deluxe or Super Deluxe Facsimile is going to be this end paper. Extremely decorative, it really complements the burgundy covers of these Bibles. Next, and one of the sole concessions to modernity in this 1611 King James Bible is going to be this 400th anniversary page, uh, which certainly was included uh, starting in 2011 in these facsimile editions. And it says that the 400th anniversary of the 1611 King James Bible, and then a quote, Lord, open the King of England's eyes. That's from William Tyndale in 1536. Certainly one of the coolest features of the original 1611 edition KJV, and it's no exception in these 1611 deluxe facsimiles, are all the introductory 
prefatory uh, and extra materials that you're going to find long before you get to the book of Genesis and the canonical, canonical books of Scripture. Um, so first thing you're going to see in any authentic 1611 King James Bible is going to be this title page. Uh, of course, our edition here on the left is the 400th anniversary of the 1611 King James Bible. And that's brought to you by the Bible Museum. And of course, in conjunction uh, with the KJV store and available from the KJV store. And we're going to take a closer look at this Old Testament title page. And this is the very famous title page, the original title page of the original 1611 King James Bible. And we see there's a lot going on here. We see to the left of the text is actually going to be Moses. Uh, you can see uh, the symbolism of the Ten Commandments there. On the right is going to be Aaron. In the four corners of this title page, you're beginning to see all the different Gospels. Uh, the top right is going to be Mark. Uh, Mark is symbolized by the lion there. Uh, in the bottom right, that is going to be St. John. Uh, John and his uh, symbolism of the eagle. Then you get the bottom left is going to be uh, Luke. Luke is here and he is signified by the ox kind of behind him there. And then the final one is Matthew. And we also are seeing uh, near the bottom, the very, very bottom, is a, symbolism, a symbol of, that's a pelican. Essentially, the pelican is feeding its young, uh, but it's feeding it from its own blood, which is a uh, symbolism of Christ's crucifixion. Uh, and, of course, ultimate sacrifice for us that we may have salvation. And you see here the text, the Holy Bible, conveying the Old Testament and the New, newly translated out of the original tongues and with the former translations, diligently compared and revised by His Majesty's special command, appointed to be read in churches, imprinted at London by Robert Barker, printer to the King's Most Excellent Majesty, Anno Domini 1611, or Year of Our Lord 1611. After the very ornate and decorative title page, we get to the Epistle Dedicatory to King James, or the Dedication to King James, as you see here. Next is the Translators to the Reader Preface. And taking a closer look here at the Translators Preface to the Reader, we see the first example of one of these decorative capital letters that you find in the original 1611, also known as a drop capital. That's a decorative Z, Z as in zeal to promote the common good. This is a very important section and one highly worth reading because it is literally written by the 1611 Translators and Translators Committee to you, to us, the readers of the King James Bible. It talks about what they did, why they did it, how they did it, and conveniently, because of the immense size of the 1611 Deluxe, and this being such a large folio pulpit sized Bible, it also has one of the larger fonts that you're going to find on any translators to the reader. We do include this in some of our premium KJV store leather Bibles. You'll see it in some Cambridge Bibles, but the font is typically going to be smaller. So that is certainly a cool feature of this Bible that uh, the translators preface to the reader, much larger, more readable font. Uh, that is, is as you get used to some of the unique 1611 spellings. Another thing worth mentioning and noticing here at this translators to the reader section is going to be the first example of the Smith's sewn binding. If we look a little bit closer here, we can see examples of the actual thread there. Zoomed in further, we can see examples of the actual white thread that's also showing the evidence of the Smithsone binding here on this 1611 Deluxe Facsimile Edition. After the translator's preface, we get to these Bible reading calendars, which are certainly unique to the original 1611 King James Bible. And you're seeing here on the right that this is the example for January. We'll take a closer look, but notice again, that's a capital I for January instead of AJ. Uh, also going to see that that's red letter. This this is an example, the first one we're seeing of that decorative red ink, which is also unique and was part of the original 1611. Uh, we'll talk more about how it is that sort of a red letter text and not the traditional use of what we think of red letter. And we'll also take a closer look at some of these calendars. And we're taking a closer look at the January monthly calendar. Once again, there's a capital I instead of a J, January. And it says how many days it has. That's 31 days. And we're seeing it's kind of the calendar here. So the sun, sunrise and sunset, uh, the hour of the day, and then morning and evening. And it's suggesting different portions of scripture to read to help you read the Bible through in a year. 
The next page shows February and March in the full page spread. And again, this is the only example you're going to see anywhere in the original 1611 KJV of this decorative red ink, which is exclusive and authentic to the original 1611 King James Bible. Now, many of you may be asking, normally in the, in the modern 2000s KJV Bible world, when we say red letter text, we're talking about the words of Christ appearing in red ink. Certainly the 1611 King James does not do that. It does not have the words of Christ in red. That's something that didn't really come about until the late 1800s, early 1900s in the Bible publishing world. But this is still a sign of authenticity and unique and exclusive to this 1611 deluxe facsimile is the decorative red ink here in the Bible reading calendar and prefatory materials of this Bible. Other prefatory sections of the original 1611 King James include the Almanac, the chart to find Easter forever, the table and calendar expressing the order of psalms and lessons to be said at morning and evening prayer, the names and order of all books of the Old and New Testaments and the Apocrypha down here, the official seal or coat of arms of King James that you also see on the front cover of the deluxe 1611 edition imitation leather, then we get to the genealogies of scripture and of mankind, and it begins here on the right with Adam and Eve. It's the first of 34 total genealogy pages. And ending here on the 34th page of the genealogies, which we want to take a closer look at. So we see at the top of 34, Salathiel, and you're seeing this genealogy and family tree going down. And then on the left side, according to Matthew, and on the right side, according to Luke, listing these names and working its way down the page. And we see at the bottom here in the written text that Joseph and Mary, both of Zerubbabel, uh, David and Judah are descendants of Christ. And it says, Joseph legally, comma, in whole, right, he is the king of the Jews, talking about Christ, which fulfilleth St. Matthew followeth. And from Mary, he became the Emmanuel and promised seed whose uh, generation St. Luke describeth. And now this is the coolest part here. Notice that it says Joseph above Christ as father. Matthew 1.16 is the reference. Has Mary the virgin as Luke chapter 1 verse 27 as the reference there. Now notice under Joseph it says by law. And then under Mary it says by nature. Well, obviously we understand this is essentially the translators explaining that Joseph was not Jesus' biological father because of the Immaculate Conception. Joseph was instead his legal father by law, whereas Mary certainly was his mother by nature. She did naturally birth him. After that conception, she did uh, have the bir virgin birth as his biological mother. Uh, really cool that the genealogies end here. Uh, Joseph, father by law, Mary, mother by nature, to Christ the Redeemer. Then we get to this gigantic, incredibly detailed two-page map of the Holy Land. Uh, we see the huge two-page spread here. Uh, it's, you see a diagram of Jerusalem as the walled city at the top left. Uh, there's extensive notes. Um, we're going to learn that essentially this was actually a map by John Speed, uh, one of the gentlemen involved in the translation, and that not only was this map essentially very well respected for its biblical use, but it even had some significance to in, in merchant use. It was such a detailed map that businessmen of the time in, in the UK uh, began using this to establish trade routes and to uh, explore some of their, their business entities. So uh, one other really unique thing on this map that we'll take a closer look at, something I found very interesting when zooming in here on the map of the Holy Land is a mention of the term Middle Earth. Middle Earth, certainly the only other time that comes to mind for myself is going to be J.R. Tolkien. Uh, and certainly wondering, uh, without having researched, uh, is this where he got the terminology for The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings? I uh, thought that was very interesting to see the inclusion of the term Middle Earth. And again, just a, an idea of uh, the scope and scale of this map and how it became, again, uh, not only a strong biblical map reference, but also, it was a strong visual resemblance to some of the other newer, newer maps of English cities at the time. And eventually, after all of those prefatory and introductory materials of the 1611 King James, we do get to the first book of the Bible, which is going to be Genesis. 
And before we take a look at that, uh, we're going to look at another important passage of Scripture in this original 1611 first edition facsimile. One of the ways that we'll show just how authentic this original 1611 edition King James facsimile is, is going to be here in the book of Ruth. Uh, Ruth chapter 3, and specifically we're going to take a look at verse number 15. Here in Ruth chapter 3 verse 15, we see, And he said, Bring the veil that thou hast upon thee, and hold it. And when she held it, he measured six measures of barley, and laid it on her, and he went into the city. That he is a matter of great debate and also a matter of great uh, authenticity of this original 1611 Bible. Uh, we say specifically in our features, this is an original he edition, 1611 printing, and Ruth 3.15. That is the he that this is talking about. Um, this was essentially just a, a printing error uh, that happened on the very first print and press run uh, by Robert Barker. Uh, basically, many different uh, print houses in London were actually printing these. Uh, not all of them had the exact same thing. There certainly wasn't the, uh, we did not have the luxury of computer accuracy and, and verification. Uh, these are literally using Gutenberg's printing press. And that is basically showing how authentic that was, that other versions of 1611s are going to say she. Um, that's again, it does not, does not prove, it is not saying anything about infallibility of the Bible uh, or imperfection of this Bible. Uh, it's simply showing that uh, while God's word is perfect, uh, men certainly are not perfect and, and what we produce is not perfect. Um, but it certainly is uh, pretty cool to see. Cannot get any more authentic than that. You know, the original 1611, the very first one that came off the press, said he, uh, when in reality that is should say she and is referring to Ruth. She's the one that got the barley and then took it into the city. As a final word regarding Ruth 3.15 and the he, she example there and which 1611 text this is, it's important to understand that again, in the year 1611, uh, no computers, no computer accuracy, did not have that luxury, of course, or using printing presses. The letters themselves, which if you look at, uh, we, that's what's known as a gothic or wood cut style font. Literally, these are individual letters being set up, uh, wood and used on the presses. And because of that, uh, and along with that, basically there was also a mixing of sheets. There were there are different sheets at the different print houses. Um, and because of this, you're going to see that basically no two 1611 edition KJVs that were actually printed in the year 1611 are 100% identical. This is just basically an unavoidable nature of printing and the setup of printing at the time and how 100% manual the process was. Uh, but it's to me, it's some of the character and some of the beauty of the original 1611. Uh, it was a massive undertaking and pretty cool that um, it has been preserved now for over 400 years, but that we can still see the original uh, in all its glory, uh, blemishes, imperfections or not. Uh, and we, we still can know and have faith. This is the word of God. This is the word of God in English. Um, and obviously in modern day printings, we now have the luxury of PDF documents, electronic documents that can stay the same, that aren't, arc that aren't altered, that we know we have computer verification of the accuracy of our text. Very quickly, we go back to Genesis 1. And we see the first book of Moses called Genesis. There's an extra E on the end of the word book. You're seeing some subheadings here at the top. The creation of the world. We see chapter 1. That almost looks like a lowercase j, but we know that's essentially reading as a lowercase i for Roman numeral 1 or chapter 1. And we're seeing here, of course, chapter 1, there's these subheadings. Uh, we'll take a little closer look at those. This chapter subheading is a translator's way of essentially laying out what's going to happen here in Genesis chapter 1. The creation of heaven and earth, of the light, of the firmament, of the uh, earth separated from the waters, and made fruitful of the sun, moon, and stars, of the fish and fowl, of beasts and cattle, of man in the image of God, uh, and to the appointment of food. And we see here, again, this is that decorative uh, drop capital, uh, essentially the first letter that's capitalized of any chapter. We're seeing here that's unique to the 1611. There are some cross-references out here um, indicated by this asterisk. There's a lot of things going on here. Uh, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. If we look really close here, again, that U uh, 
that normally that would be a V H E A V E N. That's a U. Uh, we see U's and V's are somewhat interchangeable. Uh, we see and the earth was without form. Uh, it's kind of a squiggly looking R there. Uh, F O R M E. That's an extra E on the end. What it would normally be F O R M. Uh, and then void. Um, that's essentially fully closed. That looks like the word Boyd, B-O-Y-D. That essentially should be V-O-I-D. Um, that's also, a, after the O, that's kind of a Y character. So uh, again, some interchangeable things going on. Uh, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, D-E-E-P-E, -E -E, an extra E on the end. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. Love to show that that capital S in Genesis 1-2, in the original 1611 KJV, is absolutely capitalized, uh, in identifying the deity of Christ here. Uh, the moved, there's it's some, just, again, some crazy spellings. And it's not even necessarily the spellings as much as just how decorative the letters are. Once again, these are gothic, woodcut style fonts. Um, it is not a computer-generated font. These letters are literally carved out by hand in wood and then used and set letter by letter on the printing press. That's how you can get some of these things that we'll see. There are supposedly 26 examples in the 1611 KJV where the word A-N-D is spelled A-U-D because N and U are interchangeable if flipped upside down. So basically the same woodcut letter could be both a U or an N. And there are a few times where they did not put it right side up and it's A-U-D for N instead of A-N-D for N. These are just some of the examples of things that are going on here in the book of Genesis and some of these original 1611 spellings. A uh, final thing to point out here, notice that again, even the text, both the, both the subheading text at the top and then this word was here that the Roman type was absolutely available. Uh, so in fact, the, the 1560 Geneva edition used the more modern Roman style font instead of this, what's known by historians as black letter text of the authorized version or King James version. So instead, the King James translators used the Roman text, especially in that term, to indicate that this is a word that did not appear in the original Hebrew or Aramaic text. So they basically insert these, uh, these basically Roman style words to help form complete sentences or make a complete thought in English. In modern day King James Bibles, you'll see that these words are now going to appear in italics. It's kind of ironic because uh, again, it's when you see something in italics or you see uh, the was there in the different font, it kind of stands out when in reality, that's the only word that actually wasn't in the original text or the underlying text. But for the sake of English, the whole point, this is an English Bible, us to have the Word of God in English. Essentially, we want to have those complete thoughts. And you can see uh, it's interesting how the woodcut font and then the Roman style font is interspersed throughout the text and the uses there. And between the Old and New Testaments, we see the inclusion of the Apocrypha. We know that the original 1611 edition King James did absolutely include the Apocrypha and Apocryphal books. Apocrypha, as we know, means hidden. It also is uh, universally understood as intertestamental between the Old and New Testaments. One thing we're going to point out is, see how at the top here, where we see Malachi is actually appearing in the middle, and then there are the subheadings that says the coming of office of, Jel of Elijah at the top. On the apocryphal books, you'll notice there's a, there's a distinction. Uh, it gets away from that. Instead, you see the apocryphal book name in the middle, and it just says apocrypha at the top right. Um, we'll take a look at another page example to get a better idea of this. So here in First Esdras, we see, again, it just says apocrypha, apocrypha at the top, book name in the middle. No heading, no subheading from the 1611 translators to see what's going on. Whereas only two pages back at the end of Malachi, we see Malachi at the top middle, but we also see the people and priests reproved. Then at the top of the next page, God witnesseth against sinners. So that is missing from the apocryphal books. Well, why is that? What's going on with this? Why was the Apocrypha included in the original 1611 King James? Why did the translators clearly mark these differently at the tops of the, of the pages uh, and just say Apocrypha on the outside margins with no explanation of what's going on with them? 
A short explanation would be in 1546 when the Roman Catholic Church's Council of Trent erroneously deemed the apocryphal books to be deuterocanonical, meaning that they did believe they had equal authority to Scripture. In response to that, in 1563, the Church of England produced their 39 Articles of Religion, and they said, no, the Apocrypha is not Scripture. They deemed them as the, quote-unquote, other books. The 39 Articles eloquently categorized the Apocryphal books as, to read, for example, of life and instruction of manners, but doth not apply to establish any doctrine. It's also of note that, all previous English Bibles, the predecessors to the King James, the Wycliffe, Tyndale, Coverdale, Matthews, Geneva, and Bishop's Bible all included the Apocrypha, but it was universally understood and accepted in England at the time that the Apocrypha was indeed not Scripture, even though it was absolutely included in the original 1611 King James and is a sign of authenticity. If you do not have the Apocrypha in your King James, it certainly is not an original 1611. Remember, if we go back to the page next to the King James Coat of Arms, we saw the listing of the books called Apocrypha. Notice different than the books of the New Testament or books of the Old Testament. Things that are different are certainly not the same. But the books called Apocrypha and the inclusion of those is 1st Esdras, 2nd Esdras, Tobit, Judith, the rest of Esther, Wisdom, Ecclesiasticus, Baruch, uh, the Song for Three Children, the Story of Susanna, the Idol Bell and the Dragon, the Prayer of Manasseh, 1st Maccabees, and 2nd Maccabees. After the Apocrypha, at the end here of 2nd Maccabees, we get to the New Testament title page. This New Testament title page, a little bit different than the Old Testament and the original complete Bible title page, we're actually seeing here that it lists the 12 tribes of Judah here on the left-hand side, and then it's listing all 12 of the apostles on the right. And some more of these fun spellings, uh, the new, N-E-W-E, extra E on the end of new. And then testament uh, looks almost more like an F, but you, you'll learn to see that those are S's in the, new, in, in the 1611 King James Bible. And then Lord and Savior, again, that's a U, S-A-U instead of a V. Uh, literally, we can see it there because the U appears again, S-A-U-A-I-O-U-R instead of S-A-V-I-O-U-R. And then Jesus Christ, first appearance there. Again, Jesus, the name of Jesus, uh, capital I instead of a J, I-E-S-V-S, V and -S -S, U's interchangeable instead of J-E-S-U-S, -S, Christ. Uh, but really cool, another decorative title page here uh, for the New Testament. We get to the first book of the New Testament, the Gospel of Matthew. And the page heading at the top of the page here is the generation of Christ. Why are those genealogies important? Why is it important? Why was that included as a, a prefatory material in the 1611 King James? The Gospel according to Matthew is the perfect example of why. Once again, in the subheading, we're seeing the genealogy of Christ from Abraham to Joseph. Remember, Matthew was listed as the reference of how Jesus would be uh, the father of Jesus in law. Not biology, not naturally, but in law. And we see here uh, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, begat, fathered, same thing, interchangeable. And Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And it goes on like that in the book of Matthew, uh, all the way down essentially to uh, verse number 16 here, uh, and Joseph or, and Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. The genealogies are important, the genealogy of Christ, uh, that he came from the tribe of, of, of Israel uh, and was the lineage and scene of, of David and Abraham is very important. And that's why Matthew led off with that in the very first gospel, gospel which is the story, it is the testament of Jesus, who we absolutely believe is the Son of God and the Christ. We've now flipped over to the gospel according to John. Taking a closer look here at John 1, we see again gospel according to John. Two interesting things there. Again, there is that slight little mark at the top of what almost looks like an F. 
We know in the 1611 KJV English, that was an S, so gospel, according to John. Uh, but again, that strange and ambiguous use of the capital I for instead of a J, interchangeable, I and J, uh, yawn, I-O-H-N, when it would normally be, of course, capital J-O-H-N. But then we're going to notice here, uh, such as verse uh, number six, says there was a man from, there's a man went from God whose name was John. And we see there in that Gothic wood font in, in essentially the original black letter text, that does look a little bit more like a J than an I. So it's interesting that there, the, the Roman text uh, is using the capital I, whereas the Gothic woodcut text essentially looks more like a J. Um, but if you look here at verse number four, in him was life and the life was the light of men. That I, that essentially the I and the J and John, they look exactly the same. So that could be part of the ambiguity there. And you can just know, and you can know that's either going to be an I or a J, depending on which is correct for that instance. Second to last New Testament verse example brings us here to 2 Timothy. We love checking this verse for the authenticity of any King James Version text, let alone this original 1611 KJV text. This is the book of 2 Timothy, and this is chapter 3. Uh, the last verse, 17, appears right up here before the beginning of chapter 4. says that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. TH, we know that squiggly R, is an, that's an R, that squiggly letter there. T-H-R-O-U-G-H-L-Y, absolutely, throughly, not thoroughly, furnished unto all good works. Uh, it's a cool example to see that that is present even in the original 1611 KJV text. And the final text example we will check here comes to the book of 1 John in the New Testament. And here in 1 John, we see chapter 5 down here, the Roman numeral 5, and then the headings, God's love, and then also the three witnesses. How important is this text? The subheading literally deals with verses 7 and 8. So 1 John 5, 7 and 8. For there are three that bear record in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Ghost. And these three are one. And there are three that bear witness in earth, the Spirit and the water and the blood. And these three agree in one. Notice that S in Spirit right there. And 1 John 5, 8 is absolutely capitalized. It appears that way here in 1611. Uh, any alteration in any more modern KJV Bible uh, that uses a lowercase s is absolutely a deviation from the original 1611 text and the original 1611 translator's intent. We like seeing that capitalized. We believe that it's absolutely referring to the Holy Spirit of God, uh, the deity of God, one of the three witnesses, the doctrine of the Trinity, very, very clearly supported here in verses 7 and 8 of 1 John chapter 5. So there we have it. 1611 King James Bible Deluxe and Super Deluxe Facsimile Editions. Exact page-for-page -page photographic duplicates and replicas of the original 1611 King James Bible. Word for word and letter for letter, original 1611 authorized version text, original He edition 1611 printing and Ruth 315, and includes the Apocrypha. Available in this deluxe edition, Buffalino Fisca Goma imitation leather binding with King James coat of arms seal on the front cover. And the Super Deluxe Edition, burgundy, full grain, genuine cowhide leather binding with extra large spine hub bands and gold spine stamping. Printed on rag cotton sheet paper, not wood pulp or cream paper. Smithsone page edges with extra heavy duty stitching for page turning durability. Enormous full-size edition dimensions, 12 inches wide, 17 inches tall, and 5 inches thick. With open reading dimensions spreading to nearly 30 inches when measuring corner to corner. And weighs nearly 30 pounds, including its protective slip case. Don't forget that you also get your free bonus leaf from an original 400-year-old 1611 edition Bible included with every deluxe or super deluxe facsimile purchase. It also comes with free FedEx shipping in the continental U.S. 
Simply put, this is the most authentic 1611 KJV Bible facsimile in the world. We hope you enjoyed this video preview of the 1611 King James Bible Deluxe and Super Deluxe Facsimile Editions from the KJV Store, the number one source for all things KJV.